Hi, I'm Charles Pan, and welcome to Making Money right here, right now. That's exactly what we do. Every single night, we help you make money in the stock market. Now, we do it with what we call the real, real deal, because here's the thing. You get all kinds of headlines on your smartphones, and that's exactly what they are. They're headlines. Same thing when your stock comes out. The earnings are out. It's up to, it's down to. All knee-jerk reactions. Here's the real deal. You've got to be able to monitor and understand exactly what's going on, and the only way to do that Peeling away the layers and crunching the numbers. That's my job. Here to help our investment pros. Heath is out, but our buddy Jim Frischling is with us. New Old Capital back. You ready to rock and roll? Absolutely. All right, you better be, man. It's Monday, and the market was a little weird today. Right, Matt? It was weird, but it was good. I'm it was happy. good? I'm I got happy. waxed today. You I'm kidding happy. me? <laughs> Tracy, <laughs> tell, tell this guy. I'm not used to these ideas going down. <laughs> it was Happens good. Happens to the best of us. I hear you. And Scotty Nell Hughes from the Tea Party News Network joins us today as well. Welcome to the show. I, I'm excited. You guys aren't going to beat me up too much on my first time on the stage. Well, you got the girls and the boys, so. You it's got, middle you school got, dance. You have an ally, <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, let's do it. Let's dig into the first real, real deal. Over the weekend, an NBC Wall Street Journal, Annenberg, poll revealed that 60 percent of Americans have the president's back with regard to his goal of, of degrading or at least eliminating the threat posed by ISIS. Yet 68 percent in that same poll have very little or just some confidence that it can get the job done. Then, of course, there was this drama or the reluctance of the administration to even use the war word up until maybe the middle of the weekend. It points to a very disturbing situation for the administration. And no matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's something that no one can cheer. And this is going to give us pause right now because I want to go early on to the, uh, and open up a page from Payne's Investment Playbook. Talk about American exceptionalism. In my mind, it's held up by four pillars, and they all seem to be under assault these days. Our military has not only kept America safe, but let's face it, the world as well, resulting in billions of people around the world entering the middle class, rather than living under the thumb of an invader or a tyrant. Then there's the industrial machine. It's the engine that's allowed us to win these wars, also to win at innovation. And while there's still no equal, it feels like maybe we've peaked. America's financial strength, I think it's underappreciated at home, but the rest of the world, they continue to buy our bonds, they continue to invest in our markets, and they clamor for American assets. But I got to tell you something, the government is spending like crazy, and they are killing the golden goose. And this quote says it all about morality. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, derived to, derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. So here's the real, real deal. If Americans bought into the idea of fundamentally changing this country, well, that's exactly what's happening. Unfortunately, though, we're unraveling. So, Matt, I want to ask you about, now I'm going to start with you, uh, Jim, the first pillar, military. We cut our military to the bone. Uh, we're reluctant to use it unless Estonia jumps on board and gives us the okay. I mean, it, what's up? We've got the most powerful military in the world, and tyrants around the world are running amok. You know, I, I think trying to run the military or make decisions about the military from a populist opinion, which seems to be what's going on right now, uh, is a failed strategy. First of all, my, my Marine friends, my military friends say, you can't pay them enough but you can pay them more. I also don't understand really what has happened since, let's say, 9-11, when the, the fervor and the attitude towards the military was so strong, and yet here we are, in, in part, that thanks to taking the fight to them. We're now in a situation where there are a budgetary line that continues to get cut and cut, sequesters. We are costing the military more money uh, and, and, and use them as, a, as almost a, a, a beating post. And in fact, I think we should be elevating their status and, and the respect they deserve. So if that means pay them more, pay them more. Well, not only are we spending less on the military, but the amount of people on active duty continues to go down over the last it's 60 crazy. years. It's nuts. So how do we get that back up is a question I ask myself. You have to get that confidence back into Americans that they want to fight for our country, fight for what's right around this world. I think the, 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 we, the fact we don't like our government like, we don't have. We don't want to go out, Charles, and say, you know what? I'm willing to put everything on the line. After 9/11, people wanted to go out and fight for what we have. We don't have that feeling in America more. We need to get that back. And people used to join the military and buy war bonds. Tracy, you've been really strong on this idea that we need boots on the ground if we're going to be successful in, in Syria and Iraq and everywhere else. That's another thing. Who would join the military with this sort of leadership? 
Well, I mean, it's much like Vietnam, right? You don't want to go out there and think you're under underappreciated and risk your life and your family. We're down $140 billion since the high of uh, military spending in 2011. And as Matt alluded to, the, the team is down. The spirit is down. It used to be people wanted to go. You know, truth of the matter is, you should go to the military. They pay for school. They pay for everything. I mean, you get a pension out of the thing. Like, let's think about this. More and more people should put this on the table when they're thinking about what to do after high school. I agree. Listen, I went to the military so I can go to school. My father had a career in the military. I think it's a fantastic way to go. Yet it's, it's people I think Scotty would want to do it. You know, uh, but again, why sign up? if the mission isn't clear and if right. your hands are going to be tied behind your back. No, that's completely it. And those wonderful things that you just mentioned, Tracy, those were the things, the first things that were cut. I mean, we're sitting mm -hmm. here seeing that the incentive to go to, to go into the military to pay for college, that's been cut. We're seeing the incentive to grow within the military has been cut as they've been reducing their officers. So not only is it disincentivizing people to join the military, it's disincentivizing those that are already in there. Let's uh, switch to another pillar, Scotty. I'll start with you about the morals, values. Uh, you know, listen, you talk talk about a lot of things when you talk to people from parroting to religion. The pendulum has swung all, I mean, it always swings back and forth, but it feels like it swung so far in the wrong direction that I don't know if it ever come back. No, I think, now here we're all about solutions here, Charles Payne, so I think there is definitely a way that it will come back. But the key is we obviously have to look at our pop culture, but more importantly, we have to encourage security. If people sit there and when they feel secure, then they're more able to act right and they're able to make right decisions. What do you decisions. mean by that? When I sit here talking about security, you, you, people, with, I think they just came up with a new poll that 47% of Americans feel less secure today than they did prior to 9-11. And yet, our consumer numbers are fourth highest, our fourth highest in, in the row, trending up high. So it's this mixed bag. We do feel safer necessarily spending our money and spending our dollar, but we don't feel safer here at home. And I think that helps in making. You need decisions. to have financial security on top of that, not just yeah. secure being, you know, the right. borders, but financially secure. You want to wake up in the morning and know that you could still make it, not worry about your finances every time you wake up in the morning. That's very key. And when you have that risk, then you're when you feel like you're under pressure, then you're more likely to take a risk, and that's not necessarily. Tracy, good. do we take the moral high ground by always putting a finger? in air to see what the consensus is around the world or based on what our beliefs are as a country? Well, I think we've taken on this role as police officer to the world where, yes, we wait to see what we need to do before we react. I don't think, we, I don't think they come to the people first for our decisions at all, because I think if they did, we'd be in a very different place in this war right now. Although we have been the policemen for a very long time and we've right. kept this world safe. But we're at a point right now, Charles, where we can't afford to continue to do this for everyone. No one really cares if we risk our men anymore. They just want us to put them out there. And we can't afford that financially, emotionally, and patriotically as a country. It's not fair to us. Patrice, we don't have the money or the manpower to do that anymore. Right. There's too many geopolitical situations going on around the world that we're, we're spread thin. We right. can't do that, Charles. I'd love to be able to do that, but I don't think we can. I just feels like, you know what, listen, we were called World War I, World War II. We've been around the world several times. We spent trillions. We've lost men and women across the planet. And, I, you know, I don't know that. I, I'm personally reluctant to give up that role because I don't see anybody else stepping into the breach. But to Tracy's point, I've been to countries where you would think, wow, there's very little, you know, people should be saying, thanks a lot. We should, you know, be hugging us. And, you know, we thought there would be a parade, uh, you know, after the first Iraq war. It doesn't materialize. No one's, no one's thrilled the fact that we set them free. We are facing a greater threat now in ISIS uh, in, in, in their positions than we did with al-Qaeda. And we saw what al-Qaeda did to us uh, with really, uh, a, I guess, a charismatic leader, but not all that incredibly well funded compared to what we're dealing with now. So I actually don't think we have a choice. We actually have to go on the offensive, and we do have to be the police of the world because that is our responsibility and our benefits that we will get right. from playing that role. All right, Matt, you brought up money a couple of times. Let's talk about that financial pillar. Uh, $17 trillion in debt. Uh, you know, uh, it's a country where we're the most heavily taxed corporate uh, taxes, uh, our, our wages have gone down. It just feels like we're a part-time job nation. What the heck is going on with that financial pillar? Well, the problem is that this would tie the military into this. If we don't feel secure at home, uh, especially financially, we're not going to spend as much. You don't take that risk. As Scotty but the government's to, spending like crazy. That's what I don't understand. The, the American public has done the right thing. They've tightened their belts as much as they could. Corporate America has tightened their belt. They've cut to the bone. Our government spends, 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 and then they borrow and spend more. But that's what frustrates all of us sitting here and all Americans even more because we realized what was going on. We stopped spending so much. We saved. But at the same time, the government's telling us to do that, but they're doing the exact opposite. So how can you have confidence in your government when they're telling you to do one thing and I'm doing something you, else? I think everyone just has to vote them out. Yeah. Stop it. 
Stop asking for, you know, whatever you need back at home. Who cares about your brand new playground? That is not for the good of the country anymore. The kids can do without all the political favors. Think big picture. I mean, think about somebody who's going to run this country financially, foreign policy, you name it. You need an a renaissance person, and no one is voting that person in. No, you, you talk about the pillars, and you mentioned the military, and we have the best military in the world. You talk about the financial system, it's not perfect, best in the world. Still, whether it's our, our, the legal yes. system surrounding it, uh, foreign countries buy our bonds. Okay, uh, c Foreign companies want to list in our market. So while it's not perfect, and I agree with you, if the government gets out of the way, we'll get stronger. But let's not kid ourselves. We do have the best financial system in the world. And I'd rather be giving that message out. You want a solution? Yeah, get the government out of the way. But look what the so amazing what's the problem? things Is going the problem on. our educational system? Is the problem then that we're, you know, kids are intrinsic learners. And then we get to a point where I feel like we suppress it. But I think you have to look at look past the ads. You can sit there and say that, and you're 100% correct, Tracy. But the problem is with campaign finance laws as it is, people buy into the, the glossiest ad that they get in their mailbox and to what they see and who's the celebrity that's doing the booty shake for them at their campaign rally. Unfortunately, that is what we are is that dealing what they with. they in Tennessee, the booty shake? Well, I was, you know, yes, they do. Whatever it takes right now. Actually, we do the hoe down there. But it's whatever it takes to win that opinion. Unfortunately, people don't take the time to research. But that's a lack research. of education, not knowing what you're voting on. I mean, if you actually are educated, you actually would care about what what they're running on, not the fact that they have the glossiest ad. That's a lack of education in this country. Do you guys feel, though, that, that the right leader only comes around maybe once every so often anyway, maybe once every couple of decades? I mean, maybe that's just the way it is, no. and hopefully we're due. No way. There, there are tons of people in this country. They just don't want to give up their cushy paychecks or whatever the heck they're doing right now to go down to D.C. and get beat up or, and get caught up right. in the system. Or they may not want to talk about what they did in high school in the 12th year of high school Fine. because it's they too embarrassing. They don't want to be vetted. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right, I guys. wouldn't want to be. <laughs> right. Hey, listen, there's a lot of great people, to your point, who don't want to deal with the nonsense. All right, well, listen, we're going to shift gears a little bit. The, the stock idea is coming up a little later. But first, an investor's guide using none other than Grammy Award-winning musician Kenny G as an example. We're going to go through the habits, both good and bad, and these are the keys to you being able to do it yourself, DIY, successfully. Stay with us if you want to make money. All right, let's get into the swing of things here. Let's blow the whistle, open up another page from Payne's Investment Playbook and talk about investors' do's and don'ts. Now, I've been getting a whole lot of great emails and texts from you guys. When I read them, I become very, very worried. When the stocks are up, you don't ask about them. When they go down, you want to sell them at a loss. I need you to help yourself. So we're going to give you the tools every time we can to do it yourself. Now, one of the problems is historically, let's face it, the average investor does horrendous when they go alone. Yes, going it alone, taking a look at this. The average investor going alone averages 2%. Real estate investment trust, 11%. Oil, even if you bought the S&P itself, which is why that's become a, a good investment. Gold, everything is beating the average investor because of emotional mistakes. We're going to use Kenny G. Last week, we saw a great article. Kenny G says that these days he makes half of his money trading stocks, the other half from music. Now, he's been in Starbucks since about the days of the IPO. Keep in mind, Starbucks up 12,000% since then. He makes a big mistake with this in my mind. He looks at it every single morning when he wakes up. Yes, we can take a look at Kenny G's investment habits and consider that one to be one of the worst. Of course, buying a great name early and holding it for more than five minutes, that's a lesson almost everybody watching probably should learn. Uh, watching these ideas too close, obviously, is going to drive you nuts. Uh, and these daily moves over a long period of time, to be quite frank with you, become indistinguishable. Again, you pull up any 10, 20, 30-year chart, you can't even see the crashes. So we're going to go talk about that with the crew right now. Brings us to our next real, real deal. Hey, trivia, what's Kenny G's last name? Gorlick. Gorlick. All right. Ding, ding. The men get it first. All right. Kenny Gorlick wakes up every single morning, and the first thing he does is he checks on his Starbucks position. Keep in mind, again, the guy bought it when it was like he heard about the company from a friend. He bought it when it was early on. I don't know. I'm not saying he's up 12,000 percent, but he's somewhere near that position. Not too bad for a jazz position, right? Now, I say, of course, with your holdings, you want to keep alerts on them, but outside of something that's not necessarily typical, let's say more than a 2 percent move, you don't need to check it first thing in the morning, okay? Maybe once a week and certainly every time the earnings come out. Matt, I want to ask you, uh, someone says I bought this for a long-term hold. How often do you think they should check it? 
I think on average, maybe once a week. Take a look and see if it moved, you know, once a week, one big move up or down. Of course, the alerts are fantastic if earnings come out or a new product comes out or CEO leaves, whatever it might be. But no more than once a week. But what an investor needs to do is look themselves in the mirror. And if they are a long-term investor, which is almost everybody watching this show, you need to invest for the long term. You bought that stock for several reasons. Unless those reasons change, you should not be looking to get out of that stock. Jim, here's the thing. When people are so myopic, they tend to overreact mm -hmm. and they tend to regret it somewhere down the road. No, look, you mentioned the pitfall. It's emotion. Uh, another pitfall is thinking that volatility or price changes is somehow unique and, and needs to be reacted to. Uh, it is about passivity. It is about compounding. It is about the long-term view. And what Matt said, you do your homework. There's a reason you bought that stock. If the price moves, okay, the price moved. Did something fundamentally change uh, in that company that made you right. think you need to rethink your, your, I guess, your investment decision? If so, then rethink your portfolio. But, but again, I, I think emotion's got to be put to the shelf. I even think for uh, long-term investors, weekly uh, checks okay, but too much isn't that part of the learning process though Charles sure. so I mean it's much like they tell women don't step on the scale every morning but we do it anyway <laughs> right so I, I think it's the same thing like I want to know okay somebody said this in the market and wow Starbucks moved and but I have to start to learn that that's because of some knee-jerk reaction. It's not because of a fundamental change, like you guys said. So maybe, maybe it's good for people. I mean, it really depends but on it's yourself. Not, though, I'll tell you why. But because, doesn't it depend on because you? Because we're, we're emotional people. So you get, that sounds great on paper, but when you look at it, unfortunately, they're going to hit that sell button and right. then think about that's it. That's what happens, but not, guys. Not necessarily. I have a mother-in-law that every day she tracks her stocks, and I can go back the past four years and see. And she just likes to watch the trend, which is what our boy Kenny G likes to do, so lay off him. Yeah. But, you know, he has nothing else to do right now. It's not like he's got, you know, a new record he's made. I mean, it's jazz. And could it be a girls versus boys thing? We have a little bit more control, maybe? And we want to watch it. You're trigger happy? <laughs> exactly. We want to sit there and watch it. That doesn't mean we're going to sell it. you got to sit there and work on it. I am so going to hit that. Well, that there's no me. doubt that women have better control of their emotions than men. And I won't yes, dispute exactly. that part with you. We don't you. disagree. But I, will, but I will say that people tend, when the stock goes up 10%, they feel great. When it's down 10%, they're wondering if they should sell it. And that's where they do make a mistake. And that's why we had that 2%. That's on it. how I feel when I step on the scale. <laughs> <All right>. Exactly. <laughs> All right, hey, by the way, <laughs> let's talk about another area of his portfolio, Kenny G. Now, he says he keeps about 30 stocks in his portfolio. Uh, now, for the average investor, I think that's way, way too much. Maybe 10 to 20, depending on how much you have in the market. I doubt you have over 20 million like this guy. So I'm going to go to you, Tracy. Kenny G, he's an active trader, right? Um, what about the idea that uh, that he has 30 stocks? I, again, for him, I think it's fine. The average person, I think that's way too much. I think it's a lot because that requires a lot of legwork. I do. I mean, but again, maybe not so much. It depends on you and whether you're willing to sit down. I mean, because I think for 30 stocks, you got to put in a couple hours a day right. to monitor that kind right. of stuff. And if that's what you have, and and I guess it's, and to Scotty's point, I guess they haven't called him from Branson yet to bring him on down. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> you got to give the guy credit. First of all, it's not like he just goes and buys th you know 30 different stocks every day. He literally has this process, this three-step process, where he goes and he get, he asks people who he respects. And and then he sits there and research and watches for a few months, and then he buys when it dips. And that's exactly, it's not like he's just out there just throwing his money around. And he's got his assets, he's actually got them professionally invested with a firm, and then he has his own kind of play money. And that's the play, money. The play money is there's the 30 a, There's stocks. a famous study from back in 1968 says after you have 10 stocks, after that, each stock that you add to your portfolio doesn't significantly reduce your risk. So about 10 stocks is, is the key. I say about 15 for the average investor, no more than that. Um, but you have to keep in mind, you can't have 15 tech stocks. Right. You're not right, diversified. Right. You need to be diversified within those 15 as well. Right. Jim? I, I was only going to comment that it depends what those stocks are. If you right. talk about the companies like Starbucks, Coca-Cola, uh, you know, uh, an ExxonMobil, for, for example, you could put those away and focus on the, on the stocks a little more high vol. Uh, but again, I still think they shouldn't be checking so right. often. And I will say to the audience, uh, cash is a position. So you can have eight stocks and consider the other two open positions those cash is yep. considered a position. Don't ever forget that. Next, uh, we're going to take what we just learned and apply it to a real-life situation that I think is going to hit home to, with a lot of you guys. We got a letter from a, a viewer all about the steps that it takes for the average investor. Whoa, look at that. Uh, I got the answers for you. We'll be right back in three minutes to make you money. <laughs> All right, time now to address your money-making questions. Anything you're curious about a stock, the industry, the overall market, you can always ask me. And Tracy, well, you have today's Ask Pain. Yeah, I most certainly do, actually. And it's from Steve, and he was asked, I got to tell you, I can't find it. 
Where the heck did he go? It's on the screen. Get, it's on screen. We got up. Oh, oh, well, that's cheating. <laughs> I made notes. All right, I'm wondering how the average citizen can begin, well, investing. That's what I made notes about. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have a large amount of money. And what I was going to say is that he should dollar cross average himself in a little bit every week. A little bit every week. And of course, it's always uh, interesting when someone says, I don't have a lot. You know, right. a lot, not a lot to him might be 10 grand, not a lot to someone else, a thousand. Right. You can open up a, 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 an account with any of the, the major firms, right? TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, E Trade. I'd say start with a thousand bucks, five hundred bucks. Here's the most important thing. Don't just do it once. It must be a lifelong commitment. If you do it once, you turn it into a roll of the dice, and it's just not going to work out for you. You say, I'm going to do this for long term. I don't care what you start with. Yep, and you put in X amount per month or per week, whatever you can afford, and do not stop. I don't care if the stock is up or stock is down in a week or a month or a year. Keep it going because that will grow. And you know what's going to happen? As soon as you see that $1,000, whatever it is, go to $1,200. You're going you're gonna to get excited and keep putting more in, and that's I what agree. you need. TIA Cref will take as low as $25 a week. Really? Yes. Wow, that's good to know. All right, good. guys, listen, I've got an idea. In case you got a $25 bucks you want to put to work. Uh, that's going to come up. But before that, how many of your tax dollars would you be willing to shell out to pay for free medical marijuana for people who couldn't afford it? I know you're kind of generous. Tweet me. Tell me all about it. Wait until you hear this one. You cannot legalize drugs and think crime is going to go down. Uh, how do you educate an intoxicated mind? The number one better way, especially in the underserved community, is that we have to look at profiling. That was Bishop Ron Allen from the International Faith-Based Coalition on Varney and Company with me earlier this morning. Now, he was obviously riled up. Why? Well, think about it. The city of Berkeley, California, is demanding that sellers of medical marijuana set aside a stash, right, so that people earning less than $32,000 a year can get their supplies for free. So, Scotty. You moving out to Berkeley? Uh, no, I don't. I think this just shows the entitlement nation. We were just talking about earlier about responsibility and swinging, swinging that pendulum back. This does not help the situation. This is why we have a problem today. And unfortunately, I'm, we're going to see this continue to grow. And people don't realize all the other issues that kind of spawn off this type of, uh, sure. this type of talk. Free weed, if you're making less than 32000 means you'll never make more than 32000 <laughs> Listen, I'm all, for, I'm all for legalization of marijuana. But if you're doing that, then what, what happens next? A free beer for the guy at the bar who walks on a bar doesn't have 32000 Free food, for free T-shirts for the guys who make 32000 Why? But why marijuana? But why it, not everything else at that point? But then how does weed help the whole situation? Here we are, pro-business. Obviously, would you want to hire a whole company full of people that smoked weed? Well, I don't care what they do in their free time. But they they would, but how, that's the thing. That's the question we have to sit here. How is this going to <laughs> well, encourage a good economy? But it's like the economy? same parameters. And you know I can't stand this earned income tax credit. But so you get the earned income tax credit. And you can get high. And you get free weed. And I got to be honest with you, Matt. I've hired people. I've had a guy who's smoked weed for me, mm -hmm. who used to work for me and smoke weed. He was dumb. I mean, <laughs> it just <laughs> stole the hell out of his senses. This guy couldn't remember his own damn name. And I used to go on lunch and smoke weed. If I knew, I would, dis I would discriminate against a weed smoker as an employer. I, uh, I have to rethink my own drug policies on that. <laughs> I it. Uh, but I would simply say I don't see that as a benefit or a, uh, uh, something that's going to help you perform at a higher but level. But how about the idea it. that taxpayers are paying for it, Jim? Come on. Well, I, think my, I guess I'm only, I'm only turning on this part because we're talking about medical marijuana. And if they believe yeah. there yeah, are because, benefits, because if there are benefits. Because we know it's all medical. We know that all those things. They're, they're, uh, please, uh, please go That's all I can come up with. Is, uh, is uh, the nice more try medical. for that one. Yeah. Redo your policy, your hiring policies. <laughs> now, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that this whole medical marijuana thing is a little bit flimsy, just put it that way. Oh, yeah. It's not too hard to get a prescription. It takes about 30 minutes calls. and 50 bucks in California, and you could have a card. I could walk in right now in Venice Beach with 50 bucks, walk out 30 minutes later with a card, and go right to the shop. And, and what was your medical excuse? Just anything? A bad shoulder. Oh, please. Uh, and what, someone... whatever, you, whatever you could say. Bad shoulder, bad knees, I can't sleep at night. Whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's a scam. It is. Get a disability check, a marijuana card, and free weed. I mean, it's great country. California, the Golden State. Hey, guys, a new, show, uh, a new study shows that 10 p.m. Uh, on a typical weeknight, a quarter of, um, of American employees, that's 25% of us, we're still doing some kind of a work. I mean, the study found not only do Americans work longer hours, but more than likely, uh, we work on weekends, too. Now, according to Gallup, 18% of Americans are working over 60 hours a week. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing. Now, of course, I've been divorced four or five times, but forget <laughs> about it. Uh, I know, all honesty, the successful people I know have made enormous sacrifices to get where they are. Uh, and I think that's just the way it is, you know. And, and, and when I hear someone 
don't want a politician saying shared sacrifice and pay your fair share. These studies underscore the fact that anybody who makes it in this country, for the most part, has done it by sacrificing a lot, Tracy. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a, and it's a really, really hard slog, I think, to make the choices that people make. But the people that are at the top you know, nine out of ten. Even it, was to get not, to the, it was not handed to them. Is guilt, what I'm saying. How much guilt do you have when, with your kids? It's unbearable some days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I, but mean, I, I make up for it because I take the wife and the son to the city every Saturday and Sunday and spend pay. a fortune. I spend a fortune. My son, he can he can tell you different caviars. He likes tuna tartare <laughs> and salmon tartare. Are you kidding me? And that makes up for the fact that you're not around six days a week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you no, know, that's the just, thing. Yeah. You're just yeah. Okay. But you know what? For the rest of Americans that don't get to take their kids to to, to tartare or anything, it is a really hard thing right now. We do not live back in the Leave It to Beaver era. We're actually having to have parents that are working two to three jobs. And you know what? To us, it actually makes us value the time that we do have together. So there's nothing wrong about hard work. And I will tell you, at least my children are learning. The idea that hard work actually will pay. So off. you don't buy into the work-life balance thing that's being debated now. Maybe I, you should dial it back a little bit, Scotty. You know what? I literally, I'm right now. I, I live in Tennessee. I'm here in New York every other week because I really love my job and I love what I'm doing. So I mean, that you're talking to the wrong woman on that one. And I know it, you do what it takes to get what it, the time done. And hopefully down the road, my children will not that have to. That balance, you know. I read a couple articles say about that. That's people that are lazy. You yes. know, nobody becomes an entrepreneur and <laughs> thinking that okay, I'm not going to work more. I was emailing Charles Saturday from my office, and all of a sudden, next to me, this guy walks by and he's. He's an entrepreneur too. He goes, what the heck are you doing here? He's like, go home, get a life. But you know what? I looked around and a lot of the offices were full. All entrepreneurs, all starting businesses, all becoming successful in their working Saturdays and you have to do that. And the study shows micro entrepreneurs, very small companies, typically work 50% more hours than the average American out there. And that's not even counting the hours that they're not even recording. I mean, even yeah, when we're exactly. not at home, we're still on our, our iPads. On. We're still on our phones. And let's even talk about, you know, if it's not only that, it's the ones of the trust funds. You know, maybe my parents' generation had trust fund babies. Everybody were able to inherit something. My generation has very few of those. So actually we are having to cover because we're not going to have that lazy. Yeah, my behind. generation was the last to get that cash. Well, I didn't, but my generation. All right, Jim, you just walked down the aisle recently. I, I hope you had a, a real serious, honest discussion with, with your new wife about your work habits here. I, uh, I, fortunately, uh, she understands the way I work, supports the way I work, and actually that's why uh, I think I was so comfortable uh, getting married and, and, and making her a partner in my life. Uh, I, I don't believe in 40-hour work week. That's too tough for me. Matt made the point about being entrepreneurial. Uh, there, yes, I'm one of those guys, one of those 25% working it well into the evenings, but we're trying to build a better life for ourselves, build something together, and, uh, and it does require a lot of sacrifice and a lot of work. It's that also, is such a it, newlead feeling right there. But I just it's want to point that out. You are so in the newlywed but phase. But we're also look how too like this area just we I mean we sure. work around here people in other parts of this yeah. country think that we're bananas you know if I tell anybody that it takes me you know close to an hour and a half to get to work someday they don't even know how to respond to that and meanwhile I'm one of how many you and I yeah. are sitting next yeah. to each other I know it's funny I I've had friend in Bo friends in Boca for instance man traffic was tough today right? it took me 12 minutes to get to work <laughs> like, all right all right guys thanks a lot hey the next stock idea is coming up up till now, now, I've been pretty reluctant to mention anything in the whole financial space, but I got to tell you, the risk reward has shifted dramatically, especially if you're long term investors. Not doing God's work, but enough for this stock to go higher. Stay right here. Uh, by the way, our week long coverage of the Alibaba IPO continues. And of course, be sure to send me your questions so we can answer them live right here on the show. And keep it right here because the goal is to make you money. It's time for Upon Further Review. So everybody's been talking about Alibaba, and after the bell, Alibaba responded to immense demand for its initial public offering. They've announced a new pricing range. Uh, they're talking $66 to $68 now. It's not time yet to say whether you should buy it or not, but at this moment, my gut's saying that this stock probably could hit 100 bucks maybe on the first day of trading. We're going to continue to evaluate it every single night leading into the first day of trading. Although the Chinese internet giant is getting the most action with respect to the headlines, it's going to be tough for it to beat the performance of an Israeli company called Rewalk. It went public this past Friday up nearly 200% already. It's an amazing company.
They make wearable robotic suits designed to assist paraplegics walk again. You're looking at the footage right there. Uh, listen, it's, it's not the glitzy stuff. You, you remember the exoskeletal stuff like RoboCop? But here's the most important thing. This thing really does work. In fact, after 10 hours of training, people confined to wheelchairs can actually use the device and walk on their own. So upon further review, will there be a sunshine period between the time robots ro dramatically improve our lives before they take over the world, Tracy. Oh, will you stop with this? <laughs> what is it, 20 years? I have never met such a large, paranoid man in my whole life. I mean, <laughs> let them come. Let them come do everything they need to come and do. I don't really care. And I think the fact that they can help people walk How amazing and write, I mean, it's it's brilliant. It's it really brilliant. is beautiful. It, it warms your heart and it warms your wallet. Two of the best things. How can you lose in that kind of a stock unless you're Kenny G starts investing? <laughs> and I'm going to be a little afraid at this point. Can it help you sing or play? What you played flute, the violin, uh, sax, 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 yeah, sorry, jazz. Flute. All right, listen. Uh, I like the robotics. Obviously, I talked about that ETF a couple times. R -O -B What's the symbol? R O B O robotics. Okay. But one of the top holdings in here, I know you like stocks better. Uh, Cognix, C G N X. So it's not the robotics that you think of, but it's automation. They make the vision. So all these machines and all these factories, and when it goes by, it's a little vision sensor. That's what they make. So everything has to be automated. All these robots have the sensor in it, and that's what they make. So I like that stock. You like this space, Jim? Uh, I, I do, and yet when trying to think of a company uh, that I thought would do well with it, I can't help but think of actually Google. Uh, because if there's someone that's going to do well in this space, Google will buy them. Uh, and I looked at the acquisitions they've yeah. made, uh, Boston Dynamics and others, I, and also not to discredit their, uh, their, their uh, auto cars uh, robot that I've now driven 500,000 miles without an incident. And I keep thinking that when I found a small company, Google's the one that's identified them long before others and long before it goes public and takes them out to watch them in this space. Speaking of which, uh, you just jarred my, uh, I got a couple of tweets and emails today on Mobileye, a grand slam. Uh, some people might have traded it, some didn't. It's pulled back enough in my mind that it's a buy anytime this week on weakness. Uh, but back to, to the robot thing though, Tracy. I, it really is absolutely amazing. Now this is, a, is, is an Israeli company. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a press on it before, but it's amazing. Hardly anyone's talking about it. It's really crazy. This it, thing is, a, look what it does for people. The Israelis have been on the forefront of the technological boom from the get-go, from the dot-com. I mean, that's really, I think, where it started. We were following Israeli companies back in the 90s before they, we were following companies here in the United States. The Israelis have been on the front of this, and I think they're going to continue to do so. I, I, but I also think, though, that, Charles, you can't be afraid of this. This is coming. And this will be here in the United States. I know soon we'll enough. have a honeymoon period between man and robot, and I'll try to enjoy <laughs> it. You don't have to hold and then hands. I'll, and then I'll move to Belize. You don't have to hold hands. You just have to let them clean the kitchen. All right, all right, like the Roomba. Hey, the next investment idea is coming <laughs> I mean, up real soon. It's a big bank. You all know about it. It's somewhat volatile, but I think it's a really great stock to hold for a long term. Perfect for most portfolios. I'll tell you all about it when we come back, because we're here to make you money. All right, let's get down to it. Help you make some money today. The stock idea is Goldman Sachs, ticker symbol GS. Now, in the sixth anniversary, that's today of the Lehman debacle, I actually think that Goldman Sachs is a real good place for investors who are looking for stability to the upside. It's something you should consider. They pay a $2.20 dividend yield. In the most recent quarter, they reported revenue $9.13 billion. Investment banking was almost $2 billion. That was up 15%. Now, the only problem they had was institutional business. At almost $4 billion, it was down 11%. But investing and lending, up 46%. Investment management, up 8%. Assets under management climbed 19% year over year to over a trillion dollars. This company's number one in announcing completed mergers. We know we're in a big mergers and acquisition phase. Well, uh, they did extraordinarily well in equities and also equity-related offerings as well. Now, there's some concern about Dodd-Frank and the Basel requirements. I think, though, most investors are over the idea that those pose a great risk to the company anymore. On that note, the stockbroker... Um, uh, uh, just broke above the, the double top today uh, on pretty good volume. So I like it without a whole lot of technical resistance points. I mean, over the next year, I think you can see it rally up to $220. Short term, it's not for traders. Long term, I think it's yes, although it is extraordinarily volatile, much more than the average market. And of course, it's an investment banking name. All right, Matt, what do you think of Goldman Sachs? Who are you and what have you done with Charles Payne? <laughs> <laughs> because when I got this symbol today, I was like, I, the banks, I, you've been against the banks a lot, um, but I own this for clients. I love this company. Um, this is a gauge for me. If you want to invest in a global growth, I think the financials will lead the way. 
The New York Stock Exchange Broker Dealer Index, if I'm looking in bigger hole, just broke out to a six-year high last week, which is fantastic. This stock broke out today to a two-year high. I think it retests the all-time high at 240 in next year. Implications from the Fed raising rates, good or bad for banks? I think it's going to be better for the regional banks, but it still will be good for some of these inf large institutions as well. You, you chose the best player in the space. And, and, and while the regulatory framework is a headwind uh, for all banks, the fact is they are Goldman Sachs is better positioned uh, to deal with this, including some of the European regs. And you highlight the, uh, the M&A activity, and specifically international M&A up over 50%, and Goldman's a dominant player in the space. So, no, a big fan of your pick today. Now, but I, too, thought a, a letter was missing in the ticker when they sent it over to us. Like, it must be GES or something. I'm surprised, Goldman, over Morgan Stanley, because their wealth management division is going to blow it away. Goldman Sachs is, on the, on the, is looking for one right now because... Because of all the regulation, wealth management is really the easiest place for them to make money these days. You know, I, I, I looked at uh, Morgan Stanley hard. I looked at J.P. Morgan hard. Um, I like the valuations on Goldman Sachs a little bit more. I think, you know, I mean, it's one of these spaces, I think, the same title, lift all ships. But I think Goldman's yeah. a little, even though it's a $100 stock, I think it's uh, cheaper. Okay, cheapest. I was a little bit surprised with you. I like the rest of this panel with you, with you, Charles. To be honest with you, I think financials might be taking a hit soon, so I'm a little bit more cautious. I actually think it might have peaked. I would kind of sell if it was. Oh, okay. But I have to, we can't all get along here. You have to have fair and balanced. Speaking of which, <laughs> we have to give a shout out today to my man, Jim Frischling. That's right, Jim. I mentioned earlier in the show, Jim got hits just a week ago. Take a Aww. look at that beautiful picture. I told you he was newlywed. I knew you were newlywed. He finally took Gosh. the plunge. Look at him and his amazing wife. That and is and a the dog. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give a bigger shout out to your dog, Eli, for taking part in the festivities. Um, listen, the whole team Aww, really awesome. wishes you uh, all the best. That is very nice of you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Bye Everybody appreciates you. Everybody loves you. You're a, great, you're a great guy and a good gentleman. We appreciate it. Thank Congratulations. you very much. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, forget the surveys. I spent time with real millennials over this weekend. I owe them an apology. That's right. They're going to get one. We're going to talk about them and their story. It's Payne's Passion, and it's next. So I had a bunch of people over the house uh, to watch the fight on Saturday. And my nephew, he brought a lot of his friends. And, you know, I know we criticize millennials a lot, but... I got to tell you, all of his friends had it gone on. I mean, they weren't content with their jobs. And, and a couple of them have what typically have been career jobs, like working for the electric company or Verizon. Uh, you know, and I get the surveys. We talk about it a lot. We talk about the data points. Uh, but you know what? These kids, they were not intimidated. They want to go out and do this thing that we call life. They don't feel entitled. They don't want to wait around for the right opportunity. They're out there trying to carve a niche out. And I tell you, this is absolutely amazing. They're dreamers. They are doers. You know, so, Scotty, you're, you're the married millennial here. You know, normally we pick on the millennials, but <laughs> I, I was really, really impressed with these kids. Well, I'm glad you're impressed with them. And I know on this show we try to be positive, but I am absolutely positively sick of us considering millennials just to be those 21 or the 18 to the 25-year-olds. You know, Barack Obama did not do them a favor when they put them on Obamacare until 26, because that literally just said, yep, we don't think they're responsible either. We never talk about the 26 to 34-year-olds. That's the other part. Those are the ones that are making money. Those are the ones that have seven, eight, and nine-year-old uh, year old children dealing with with education, second house, maybe third or fourth car. We never talk about those folks, and their income is double what that first sector if you could, is. If you could give them their own name, then what would it be? Um, the real millennials. <laughs> you know, the, the real millennials. You have, your, millennials. you have your wives and your millennials. They might be asking why we are the real millennials, because we are the ones that need to be sitting here and talked about, because we're the ones spending money. They're still spending money. No, but unfortunately, we have to talk about the other group, because the other group's going to be where you are in about five or six years, and they are underachieving. So, no, we can't ignore them. Sure, Don't your group ignore is doing them, fine, but, but we can't can't ignore the fact that they are underachieving. They're in their parents' basements. You can't ignore that fact. No, but I think that's what every generation. Let's think back to even I'm sure when the baby boomers were just getting out of college or didn't go to college. They were in their parents' gener. They were in their parents' basements. I basement disagree, 100. Well. No, you when think... I was 18 years, I got out. You want to get out of the house. You want to get your life going. Go to college. Get an education. Yeah. Well, I tell you, my pop made it pretty clear. You got to leave at yep. 17. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm Italian. I hope they stay forever. Oh. <laughs> We won't even talk about Italian, Italy's uh, economy. All right, no. time to see what... And that uh, would be why. What you guys are saying at home. We had a lot of great stuff coming out. Uh, first, uh, Snowmass Dog says, I'm a cattle farmer. There are no weekends or holidays. If I want to go away, I have to pay someone to do my work. Can't just close up. Love you, man. Mm -hmm. That's what we talk about. Go West to, uh, to Georgia says... 
Hey, another thank you. Dad's been paraplegic 28 years and never would have known about Real Walk, Rewalk without your show. Anxious to do my homework. I'm anxious for you to do the homework too. That's really a beautiful thing. I also had a tweet on Yelp. Uh, Yelp is a volatile high beta stock. I try to talk about it all the time. I wish they all went straight up and for the most part they have. All the high beta names got hit, but I still feel very good about Yelp. Although I will say, I hope management does change its mind with respect to somehow forcing reviewers to show more, you know, show more evidence that they actually, yeah, yeah, that's the word. So, but I still pretty feel, feel pretty good about it. What you feel about that today? A lot of people are going to see the newspaper tomorrow and see that the Dow was up. Nasdaq got a blood, uh, got crushed. Well, you mentioned a high bid of names. It basically was what they call the risk off trade today. People are going into the more uh, boring names. Like Disney had a nice day today. The, the names that aren't going to be affected as much if Yellen comes out Wednesday and does disappoint so us So you blame off. Yellen, not Alibaba. What about yes. you, Jim? Uh, a little bit of focus, I think, on housing, uh, right? Right now and people are a little nervous about the weakness it's a key driver of the economy uh, but I think we're going to continue to grind higher all right guys hey thanks a lot we had a fantastic show of course thanks for joining us every night 6 p.m. and of course if you can't see it you want a DVR so you don't want to miss a moment of making money I'll see you tomorrow morning on Varney and company that starts at 11 o'clock we want to say thank you to our millennial X is that a good <laughs> no I'm, well I came millennial X I'll be on the line all right <laughs> and uh, not necessarily a millennial but he is the man Lou Dobbs is next keep it right here Fox Business